Welcome everyone to From Guest to Member, What's Your Story? My name is Jackie Cam Blackard, and I will be helping you transition your guest to a member. I'm going to ask each one of you in one sentence, why did you join Toastmasters? Angie? I joined Toastmasters to benefit my professional life. I was a scientist and I was giving presentations a lot. So I wanted to beef up my presentation skills. Thank and it you turned for... into so much more. <laughs> Lamont, why did you become a Toastmaster? We'll catch you later. Rand, why did you become a Toastmaster? I'm retired. And during my career as a civil engineering project manager, I had to give presentations before groups of, oh, 20 or 30 fellow engineers and team members. And I always had a fear of public speaking. So when I joined Toastmasters more than seven years ago, my primary goal was to overcome that fear of public speaking. But I found under the old uh, program, not before, I mean, this was before Pathways, that uh setting a goal to achieve competent communicator and competent leader within one year and win the club's shooting star award was helpful because it gave me the incentive to take on the role of vice president of public relations it kept me giving speeches uh i think that over the years i've definitely overcome my fear of public speaking. I'm All my life I was basically an introvert, even though I was a manager in, in employment. That's so great. The benefits That's... of of Toastmasters are, 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 can be quite, quite helpful. You're right. Jim, why did you become a Toastmaster? Basically just to get more comfortable uh, speaking in front of people. And even not just big groups, even in small groups, just the, I, I sometimes say I used to be real quiet. Now I'm, uh, I'm loud, loud and obnoxious, but I don't, <laughs> I don't blame that on Toastmasters. <laughs> Karen, why did you become a Toastmaster? Well, I became because I love to learn. I love to grow. I believe that I wanted to be become a great uh, presenter and storyteller, and then uh, started the club here and wanted to share this wonderful gift with others. Awesome, Lynn. Why did you become a Toastmaster? I began a uh, entrepreneurial business, and I decided that I need communication skills. And when I did that, it improved my confidence in myself, and I have grown. And I just want to share that with people that have trouble expressing themselves. Oh, that's amazing. Sandra, why did you become a Toastmaster? Hello, I became a Toastmaster in the Air Force when I was in the Air Force at three different locations in Colorado Springs and in Mississippi. And then when I came up to Keys to Scott Air Force Base near St. Louis and I originally joined to help improve speaking abilities. I love public speaking, but of course, Toastmasters helps you improve leadership abilities also. So true. Lamont, why did you become a Toastmaster? Well, the, truth, the truth of the matter <laughs> yeah, is uh, when my aunt I'm at home. had a birthday party when, for her 75th birthday, and someone had the audacity to put a microphone in my face and say, what do you want to tell your aunt? I was like a deer caught in headlights. I knew absolutely nothing to say. I, I couldn't speak. I was so embarrassed that uh, that evening I got home and I went, I asked Google what to do and Google answered <laughs> with Toastmasters. <laughs> 
<laughs> I then told uh, Elaine that uh, you need you need to join Toastmasters because I think it would really help you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, she and I joined together and have been part of St. Clair ever since. Great story. Rahul, why did you become a Toastmaster? Sure, Jackie. And Greg and a couple others have already seen this or heard this because I talked about this in my previous session uh, because I believe in time travel. Seriously. <laughs> so if, if you travel back in time to when I was five years old, and if you give me the permission to share my screen, this is what it looked like. Um... Can you see? Yes, <laughs> this is precisely what I look like. And Lemon, I heard what you said. So uh, as a kid, five years old, I did not know what the heck I was supposed to do. Standing on that stage, the only thing that I could say there was my name. And it was the most embarrassing day of my whole life. Fortunately for me, my father, he was my mentor. So he sat me down for an hour. We talked heart to heart and we decided that we'll get rid of this so-called stage fright or whatever crap this is. <laughs> and we will overcome this and we will have a great public speaking journey. So here I am. Awesome. Karen, awesome. can you share? Ariel, why did you become a Toastmaster? <clears throat> Um, my joining Toastmasters was born out of uh, boredom. I was at home during COVID and um, definitely was looking for ways, um, you know, after spending enough time watching movies and going on walks, um, there was a, you know, the part of me that wanted to nurture my skills once the world opened up again. So um, luckily enough, I was connected to a network of humans that had been I'd had already started this club. And so our club is purely virtual. So it met my needs perfectly. Um, we had uh, already a few members and my joining helped me to be more social during the pandemic and also to help boost some of my skills, publicly speaking and socializing. And so it's it was serving me then and it continues to serve me now that we've you know opened the world up again and building connections with people in the real world and bringing them into Toastmasters is sort of a growth edge of mine. And I'm grateful to uh, take on that challenge. Great. Craig, why did you become a Toastmaster? My story similar to Lamont's. And I kind of looked like Raul when uh, my daughter actually attended a youth leadership program. And at the last session, they invited me to do a table topic. And, you know, I looked like Raul's picture there where it was a simple question, but I didn't get past the first 20 seconds. So when the opportunity came up to join Toastmasters, I did. And that was 26 years ago and been enjoying it ever since. And now I'm teaching youth leadership. So you are doing a great job. Yeah. And he, he like, really started when he was six years old. Look at him. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Curtis, why did you become, why did you join Toastmasters? You're Chris, muted. Mute. You're still on mute. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that. I was actually invited while I was in the NCO Academy while I was in the Air Force. But I was knew I was getting out, Ivory, and so I didn't think no more about it. So my my career path put me in a position where it became necessary, but I still refused to go. And finally, I went as an invite, and I found out that it was people was having fun and they laughed. And they, then next thing I know, I kept on doing this. Because <laughs> like during the service, I kept re-enlisting. Patty, why did you become a Toastmaster? You're on me. There you go. Yeah, I just, I enjoy uh, speaking and I felt I was losing some of my skills for that. And I knew I, in order to keep, get better, you have to keep practicing and, and doing it. 
There you go. That's right. Paul, what, why did you become a Toastmaster? Thank you, Jackie. It started way back senior year in high school when I gave the most powerful presentation, most influential presentation I have ever have given my senior year AP psychology class. Uh, the day I lost my fear of public speaking was that day. Although I did not join Toastmasters for 15 years later after that, that was the precursor because the precursor to me joining was the opportunity I had to mentor some interns that were at my company at the time who were working on their master's thesis. Uh -huh. Some who some of whom were scared of giving a presentation, and I helped mentor three of them through their master's thesis, review their master's thesis papers, and help them develop their what became their thesis presentation when they had to defend their thesis. Great. And Thank you, Paul. mentored Great. them through it. Sylvia, you are a first year member. Why did you become a Toastmaster? So my job requires me to do presentation and to have communication skills. And I had no problem doing that because I done it in Indonesia. Two years ago, I moved to the United States and English is not my first language. And so I always have this fear that people will judge the way I talk and everything else. And so I encountered Toastmasters because actually I took a Coursera course about successful interviewing and they keep on mentioning about Toastmasters, Toastmasters. And I was like, what is this Toastmaster? Someone who toasts a bread? And so <laughs> I uh, researched about Toastmaster and finally done my research and end up with two clubs right now. And so, yeah, that's how I know and learn about those masters for my uh, to speak better English and to be comfortable speaking in English. Thank you, Sylvia. So each one of us has a different reason, but kind of very similar to why we joined Toastmasters. In this presentation, I am going to ask or tell you a little bit about how to transform a guest to a member. And it's with the acronym STORY, S-T-O-R-Y. So these are some little mnemonics to help you remember and, and help you with that transformation. The first part will be about the guest experience. And the second part will be about the member experience. When you are with a guest, start with the guest's why. Why are they interested in becoming a Toastmaster? Why you're meeting? Why are they here? As each one of you have shared, I've gotten a little bit, the opportunity to know a little bit about you. And thank you for sharing. R developing a relationship with the guests to find their relationship with communicating. Each one of you described an emotion or a feeling about communication, whether it's fear, anger, sadness. There was some emotion with communicating. What is it the guest wants to feel? They want to feel hope. They want to feel happiness. They want to feel joy. They don't want to be scared witless every time they need to make a presentation, talk in front of other people, make a toast, do a eulogy, talk in front of their boss. We want to find a way to show how Toastmasters can change their next experience. If someone had said to you, Lamont, just think the next time you make a toast, you will be doing it with a smile on your face and confidence in your voice. That would be an interesting thought as you consider joining Toastmasters. Oh, what are their options? What can this opportunity provide to them? 
Curtis, you mentioned that you keep doing this. And wouldn't it be great when they say, who needs a promotion? Curtis is like, first thing, that's me. <laughs> and why? Because they see you. They hear you. They know that you are knowledgeable. And they're interested in what you have to say. Part of it is because of your knowledge. And the other part is how you say it and how you make other people feel seen and heard. That's the same experience you want your guest to have. What's their time availability? Is it better for them to do everything in person? Is it better for them to do it online virtually? What's their time frame? Someone mentioned, I have 30 days to make a, to present, present to something. I have, I'm, I'm doing something in six months. I blank. Everybody has a time frame on what, when do they see them making those changes? How soon do they want to be competent, knowledgeable, confident? Ask them about their journey and are, are they putting a big knapsack together or are they putting a little knapsack together? What skill do they want to enhance? Some of the things that were mentioned, being able to, to present, being able to story tell, being able to answer questions on the fly, being able to critically think, being able to put it in there. So you have talked to your guest and in that short period of time, you have gained information about them. What is it they want to do? You may get all this information in five minutes. It might take 10 minutes. It might take 30 minutes. But help them to tell you what it is they want. And when you do that, you will find out their story. You'll find out, why do they pick Toastmasters? I heard about it. I read about it. My boss said I should do it. What's that relationship with their communication skills? What's that emotion? What's that feeling? What are their options? Oh, I could do the um, class, an online class. I could take this class in person. I can do that. You know they have options. They don't need to come to your meeting. They don't need to come to Toastmasters. Help them find a way to determine if this is a good fit. What's their time frame or availability? Is it seven o'clock on Friday morning? Is it four o'clock on Saturday afternoon? Is it Wednesday at eight o'clock? We don't know what the time is. Maybe it's their lunch hour. And what skill do they want to work on? When you have your guest, first thing you do is you greet your guests at your meeting because everybody wants to be seen. You know that they would rather be sitting in the back seat, the very last row, so that nobody knows that they're there. But they let you know or they came, but if they have been seen and heard, they're more likely to stay. Help your guests understand each part of the meeting. You know, the three parts, prepared speech, impromptu speaking and evaluations, and what the different roles are. How does the awe counter help you in your speaking? How does your timer, all of those things, help them to understand the whys of why the meetings are developed the way they are. Make sure you obtain their phone number and email address and name. Contact the guest after the meeting, preferably as soon as the meeting finishes. Get their feedback. There, do they see themselves? Does this seem like something that could help them? And to, um, What questions do they have? What concerns do they have? And if you know what their goal is, you can kind of help them see, oh, yeah, this would help me to have more confidence this would because they, they're watching other people i don't want to say bungle through life but you know we're all making mistakes we're all learning nobody's perfect 
when they can see themselves in the members that all the members aren't perfect, they're still making mistakes. Nobody's laughing at them. They're all being supported in a positive, safe manner. Who doesn't want that? Where it's a safe place to be vulnerable and to address that fear, that emotion of scaredness, um, humiliation, all of those things that nobody wants to do in person, in public. But at least here, we have the opportunity to say, you know what? Been there, done that. I have the scars. If you have one person be a contact person for each guest, then you start developing that relationship. Make sure you invite the guest to the next meeting. Have a conversation to get to know them. Not an inquisition, you know, it's not 20 questions. Recognize and provide a solution to change that emotion because behavior changes are associated with emotions. All of you join Toastmasters because of an emotion, fear, sadness, um, all of those things. You wanted to change that. You wanted to be, to be better. You wanted all of those things. Your guest wants that too. They may not know how to ask for it. They may not know that this is okay to move forward, but you do. Empower that guest with information and confidence to take that first step. And it's all about relationships. Now let's look at the member side. What's your story as a member? In this particular case, we're gonna start at the beginning with S. You're going to talk about the skills that the guest wants to develop. Which part of Pathways is going to help them? Which part of the meeting will definitely help them? For some people that say, I'm afraid. It's like, you know what? Start at the meeting. Take a little role. Be the timer. Have that opportunity to speak. And when you have that, you will keep adding a different skill by taking a different role at the meeting. All of those things you will find that comes with practice. If you find the path that they're going to take and you highlight, start at the end, what's that level five skill? If that level five skill is a high performance leadership uh, project, then show them that levels one through four all have skills that will help them accomplish their level five, kind of like your capstone, your final exam, your, your thesis, whatever you want to call it. Level five is what you're aiming for. That will be the culmination of all that skill that you want to learn. And that one through four are all funneling to fix that. Questions? After you talk to them about the skill, what's the time frame? Do they not have time to come to the meetings all the time? You can let them know, self-study, online. You can attend any club meeting, your club, another club, all of those things. If they're trying to scrunch something in 30 days, they're gonna need a lot of practice and one or two Opportunities is not going to be enough. They may need to go elsewhere. They may, did, may need to have one-on-one -on -one time with a coach or a mentor. Oh, let's look at opportunities. What are the learning options that Toastmasters offers? Meetings, websites, podcasts, magazines, learning modules, the TLI, conferences, all of those things, they can help them gain to accomplish that skill set. And then talk to them. What's your story? What is your relationship with Toastmasters? What's your relationship with the Toastmaster club members? Did they help you? Did they, are they family? Are they just a bunch of friends? All of those things help them see into the future so that 
they feel comfortable joining. And share your why, why you became a Toastmaster. And that will help your guests see themselves in you because you join and look where you are. Hey, I want to be just like Lamont. I want to be just like Raul. I want to be just like Karen. All of those things because you're their mentor. They say, well, you can do it. You may not be perfect, but you're still trying. And if you, I, you can do that, I give it a shot too. Think about, have you answered the following? Because as the guest is thinking about it, they're like, well, they're going to say, is this going to help me? And is this a safe place for me to learn and to make mistakes? And one of the tipping points for them is, is the need to improve overriding the time and effort that is going to be needed? Because how many people put other people needs before your own? Everybody. And so for you to take time out, take the time, take the effort, take the money, to improve yourself, boy, it's got to be a pretty big issue for you to want to invest in yourself, especially if you're always used to taking care of other people. Moms and dads, caregivers, and they're used to not putting themselves first. But this is an opportunity, maybe because of work, maybe because of church, maybe because of uh, you're a volunteer organization. You are now front and center. And what are you going to do about it? And you're like, I need to work on myself. And so you do. And then do they think, uh, I'm out here all alone, sitting in the middle of the ocean by myself, and I have to figure it all out by myself. But it's like, no. You have people that are willing to help you. Is your assigned person there? Is the education person there? Is the membership person there? Is there somebody that cares whether I'm here or not here? Or that I make progress? Or that I'm improving? Or that I am addressing my needs? Or do, am I just like this? Don't know. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Was Karen here? Maybe. Maybe not. They want to feel seen, heard, and valued. Now, to recap, we have the guest's story backwards and versus the member's story going forwards. Why are you joining? What relationship do you have? What options and opportunities? What kind of time, what kind of skills? Are you getting all of that information from the guest story? And then turn it back. Show how Toastmasters can address all of those things. The pathway skills, time that's needed, the different options, resources, the relationship they're going to have in the club and showing them through your why, how they can see themselves in you. Questions? One of your uh, slides talked about how the guest feels, whether they're happy or joyful. I gave a speech one time titled, Are You Happy or Are You Joyful? And I explained the differences, basically summarizing that happiness is dependent on circumstances which can be temporary and change significantly. Whereas joyfulness is dependent upon your relationships. Number one with God, number one with family, number three with friends, number four with coworkers, and number five with neighbors. Good points there, Ann. Yeah. 
you know, I think. Would you would you mind backing up to that last slide? I I, I didn't uh, finish writing it down. I'm happy to send you the whole slide deck. Okay, thank you. Uh, just make sure that you send put your email address in the chat. Okay. Rahul, you were starting to say something. Sure, sure. No, uh, very valuable information, Jackie. And your last but one slide, I think, really hit the nail on the head because uh, we need to find out have we answered the questions for the guests. So first and foremost, obviously, will this help me? The story part of the members narrating their own stories and inspiring the guests to attend and join will help immensely. And the second thing is also, is it a safe place for me to make mistakes? And this is something which I always drive home whenever I'm making a presentation is Toastmasters is arguably the most collaborative environment that you can ever get. And I compare and contrast with a normal corporate environment where people are always, uh, and forgive me for this, but people are always out to get each other, right? Uh, we try to advance our own objectives and for no ill feeling, but people like to advance, people like to progress and there is competition. Whereas in Toastmasters, as a contrast, everyone tries to work together for a common good. So the upliftment, the skill development of a member is sort of the joint responsibility of that whole group, but the initiative has to be taken by the member or the guest. So it is the most collaborative environment that you can get. It is the safest place where nobody will penalize you or nobody will point you down for making a mistake. In fact, they will give you constructive feedback if you miss something in your speech, in your icebreaker or your table topics. So there cannot be any safer place than that. And last but not least, does someone care about me and willing to help me? Absolutely. All members are there to work together for a common good. And the most important thing that I tell people is if you are becoming a member, make sure you speak to your manager and tell them or request them to add a task in your performance evaluations related to Toastmasters. Believe it or not, my manager has done that for the past two years. Every single cycle, every six month cycle, he evaluates what's my work in the Toastmasters area, although that is not at all related to the business work that I do, but he understands that that will add immense value to what I do in business. So that is very important for people to understand and action on. So true, it rolled really good nuggets there. Thank you. Sure. So I have a question for each of you. After hearing my presentation, just tell me real quickly a, a word or a phrase, something that you would do differently in your own personal journey to transform a guest to a member? More follow-up. Keep open line. Less pomp and circumstance. Never Never tell guests that they can join any number of meetings as guests. <laughs> Inside joke from a previous conversation. <laughs> no, it's 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 true. It's true. This is a conversation that has happened a couple of times between me and my uh, VP of uh, memberships. Both of us work hand in hand to make sure that the membership advances. And he is a soft selling kind of person a softy, whereas I'm more of a, I'm from a marketing background and sales background, so I'm more of a hard sell. So I become restless if I see guests attending more than two or three times as guests. <laughs> so I follow up with them. I ask them, is there anything that you would like to see better in those meetings? Do you see the value that you were looking for when you join as a guest? Would you then like to become a member? So invariably, the point has to be drawn to that. 
great perspective. So all of you Toastmasters, this is your table topic. What will you be doing differently? Well, what I would do, it, it would can be summed up with more of you and less of me. There is a, a nervousness which causes people to talk. So even though you are introducing the club and yourself to a guest, many people, and myself included, tend to talk too much about me because that's a subject that's easy for me to recall as opposed to asking probing questions of a guest. So I need to learn to focus more on engaging the individual, getting them to talk more about themselves and finding nuggets of their response that I can build upon to encourage them to to become a member of Toastmasters. Perfect. There's a reason why each speech or each pathway begins with an icebreaker. And that's not only because people find it easier to talk about themselves personally or some give, them, give their own personal background, but but it's just like with just what was just said, you know, less of what the the uh, members or the audience are feeling, but more of what and and expressing, but more of what the guest wants to express. Thank you, absolutely, Curtis. <clears throat> I have to agree with most of what you're saying. My biggest thing is constant engagement, and follow up with them. Let them know that they, that you're interested in, and find out what they want. Pretty much the same thing I just heard. What do they want to get out of Toastmasters? I found that to be the easiest thing to uh, uh, build your rest of your speech on once they open up and say, I want to become a better presentator. Present presentant. Well, thank you very much. But anyhow, <laughs> once you find out what it is that they need, help them along that line. And I think that was the biggest draw that I know of. Thank you. Sandra. The main thing is to ask them questions and engage them without making them feel like they're giving begin being give the the fifth degree like that they might have they might have interest you know let them answer one question but don't ask them like more things that they want to do to join Toastmasters because they might not even know if they want to at that point. So just so true. You're right. Absolutely. Greg, your nuggets of wisdom? Yeah, I think for, for us, we try to do these things already, but I think our mentoring program, which is happens just after you become members, needs to be revitalized. Jim, your thoughts? Well, I probably agree with everything that's said. For looking at me specifically, I sometimes probably need to dig deeper on why they're at the meeting, what, what they're interested in and concentrate on that. And then also some follow-up, I guess, looking back, I probably could have done some more follow-up on, on certain people. And, and after this, I'm going to go back <laughs> and do some follow-up on people that uh, were interested that came to meetings, but then all of a sudden you don't hear from them any, anymore. So, uh, uh, so this, this is good. Uh, hopefully it's will mo motivate me to do that. Great. Lynn, your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> I would say probably is, uh, first of all, you have to discover their needs and then see how Toastmasters can fit in to fill those needs. And also you need to, like you say, build rapport with them. Uh, I think they want to go through this journey with someone else and not necessarily themselves or they would have done it. So I think you have to help them along the journey. Great insights. Patty. Yeah, I really like the focus. Make it more about you. And I think everybody has said that. We tend to talk about ourselves, what it's been to us, 
but dig into why they think it would be beneficial for them and what they're wanting to to get out of Toastmasters. Awesome. Angie. Didn't think I was going to call on you twice, did you? <laughs> nope. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I, pa I failed the test. I failed the test. <laughs> What will I do differently? Um, definitely more follow-ups. Definitely okay. agree with that. Um, just keep the lines of communication open. And yeah, I love the idea of going back to those previous potential member lists and reaching back out. Yep. yep. Sylvia, did you have any takeaways? I know that being I new don't have many experience yeah. because this is only my first year. But as someone uh, who decided to join Toastmaster, I uh, I would back then I would say that I would like to uh, all the pathways and everything that I finally learned as a Toastmaster be unfolded before I decided to jump in as a member. And then, uh, like everyone else said, you know, uh, try to understand the point of view of, as someone new and create a bridge on how you can help them. Because when I was a new member, it is true that I heard everyone already at one point that, and that one point is just too far away uh, to where I was. And so I just, I just like, it's too far away to the point that uh, if I'm not, if I don't, if I didn't have this uh, uh, motivation, I would just be a clamp and just close myself. And you know what? Never mind. <laughs> I'm not going to do this. But it requires a lot of motivation. And I think uh, creating a bridge to a new member saying that this is doable and this is what you'll get after you become a member and all those will uh, motivate new members to become a member or potential members to become a member. Ariel, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I I kind of echo what everybody's been saying and, and feeling sort of um, inspired by the community aspect of it. It's it's all very simple concepts. And yet when we're reminded of the steps that help a member feel more comfortable, it's, it's very empowering and it makes us feel that we can do our part to bring a new level of comfortability and almost like hospitality to our, to our meetings. Um, you know, making it a really safe space for people to feel seen and heard is just a great key element. So that's a great reminder for us. Awesome. Thank you. Rahul, I saw your hand was raised. Sure, no, I'll speak after everyone else is done speaking once. I don't want to speak. Is every, have I, who hasn't chimed in? I think everybody has. Okay. So just wanted to add two more points, uh, Jackie and others. Uh, very important, as all of you said, to understand the why of the guests, because it's very important to go into your, into their emotions, into their psyche, into their brain, and understand what is really motivating them to come to this meeting in the first place as a guest. Could be one of their friends has told them about it or they heard it in one of the newsletters or they saw an elevator cling somewhere and they came to that meeting. But understanding their why is absolutely important. Second thing is the icebreakers that we talked about. What we do in our meetings is the first few minutes of each meeting, we just use that as, as a virtual icebreaker uh, time where we chit chat about general stuff and get everyone very comfortable, similar to an in interview, right? If, when a interviewee comes in, you don't directly start asking the interviewee questions. You just let the dust settle down, uh, talk about general things, and then jump into the agenda. 
So that's what we do. That's when guests realize that, oh, it's not so bad. Uh, I think I can be comfortable here in this meeting, in this environment. And then they start contributing freely. And what we do as a result of that is after the meeting, we reserve some minutes to understand from each guest as to what they were specifically looking for in each meeting when they came up. And did they see that being that need being met? And if there is a gap, by the time people have become comfortable, they speak up openly, they talk, okay, by the way, I would have liked so-and-so to be done in this way. Then and there itself, you get that feedback. You can incorporate that in the next meeting and make it more amenable, make it more friendly for the guests the next meeting onwards. So it kind of is a repetitive process which we utilize and it helps a lot. Guests feel more belong, more engaged. They start contributing more and more and they feel happy. Awesome. Thank you very much. So one last table topic. In five words or less, <clears throat> is there something that could have been done when you first went to a meeting that would have made you join Toastmasters sooner? They pay for my membership. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good call out. Not sure how feasible that might be, but excellent call out. <laughs> you opened a can of worms. <laughs> I think in one of the last breakouts, I think in the morning time, there was somebody that mentioned, I forget which, um, somebody mentioned uh, sponsoring some of the younger uh, people coming in. And I, and it, it definitely had me scratching my head thinking, well, yes and no. I feel that, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's not a, it's not a very prohibitive price point, at least not yet. Maybe when it's, when it goes up a notch, we might see some of that for right now. I feel that um, the motivation really has to come from within. Yes, we make a very comfortable environment. Yes, we answer everybody's questions. We make it safe and nurture. However, as a coach, I find that somebody really needs to have the volition internally to make that step. And you'll find a lot of attrition if you help too much along the way, right? So there's kind of that trade-off between, you know, encouraging and perhaps even sponsoring a younger member and then making sure that they really feel motivated and, and that they want to do it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll lose them anyway, right? Good point. Good point. Paul has his hand up. Yes, Paul. Your question was, sorry, your, your question was in five words or less, say what? I'm sorry, I got distracted. Well, is there something that could have been said or done to make you join Toastmasters sooner. Great, thank you. I would say my response, similar to the question you'd asked before that, it's not about the meeting. <clears throat> Comes from the PMI, Project Management Institute. Meetings are tools and techniques. And where I feel, and this be honest feedback, where in general, most Toastmasters trainings I attend, they focus on the meeting. How do I organize? How do, what is my role for the meeting as in this office or that office and that office? I would, in my perspective, say it's not about the meeting. As was just indicated by everybody here in this room about why they joined or what they do to help members join, many times it's not because I want to learn how to run a more effective meeting. It's a side benefit. But I'd say PMI got it right, where a meeting is a tool and technique we use to achieve a process. Meetings are not processes in themselves. If you're interested a little bit more about that, I'm going to challenge you to look up on the PMI website about inputs, outputs, and tools and techniques and processes. Leave you hanging. <laughs> Good challenge. What is PMI? PMI is the Project Management Institute. Okay. 
All right. If there's no other comments, I we are a little late on our time, so I just wanted to thank Jackie Cam Blackard for our presentation today. I think it was wonderful. So a round of applause to you. Thank you all for your time and attention, and I hope this has been helpful. Yes, thank you all for attending, and that will close out our summer TLI.